Welcome to the second season of Into the Forge, the Lemnos podcast, talking with hardware entrepreneurs about the journey, tools, and lessons that shape their startup and product. For today's episode, I'll be talking with Noah Reddy Campbell, the founder of Built Robotics. If you haven't been to their site yet and seen this glorious robotic solution, go there now. You won't be disappointed. Hey Noah, why don't you give me your background? Sure. Um, so I studied computer science and business at UPenn, okay. and my first job was at Google. Uh, I was an associate product manager working on ads there, but um, I knew I really wanted to do startups. So I actually only stayed at Google for about three and a half months. Um, I, I spent more time interviewing for my job at Google than I actually lasted. And what year, like, or what time frame did you join Google? Is this like the this early 2010, years? 2010. 2010. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. And. Uh, so I left and I met my co-founder there. He was an engineer on ads. And we basically spent a year kind of working on different side projects. Um, started off working on something that uh, was in the payment space that I'd kind of been interested in in college. Um, decided that wasn't going to work. And then eventually we came up with this idea for an e-commerce business. Okay. Uh, it was called Twice. And the idea was basically to be an online secondhand clothing store. Um, my, I had kind of some experience with that because I'd gone to boarding school on a full scholarship and I had to wear a nice uh, shirt and slacks and tie every day. And, um, I got most of that stuff at Salvation Army. So I knew there were some really good quality clothing items out there, but also you could get them for really cheap. Right. Um, and I basically wanted to create that type of experience on the web. So when Um, you created twice, like it's interesting, I I had heard about this before, but I was like, I couldn't, I never heard that backstory. Now I'm like, Oh man, you were the perfect guy for the job, right? You yeah. really, I, again, it was something you had personal experience in. Absolutely, yep. Yeah. Um, and did that for about four years. Um, we raised $23 million for the business. Andreessen Horowitz was our largest investor. Okay. And uh, sold it to eBay in 2015. Um, it was a great experience. Um, I think that one of the things I learned from it, though, was that the problem meant something to me because I had, you know, I'd gone through uh, boarding school like that, but I wasn't super passionate about the um, the technology challenges there. When right. it's an e-commerce business, there's a lot of operations. You know, we actually were, were launching uh, over three thousand new items per day, which is more than Amazon wow. launches, um, because we every single one of our SKUs was a one-off. Right. So there there was some technology there, um, but it, it didn't get me excited just thinking about it. Right. And when I was thinking about what I wanted to do next, uh, that was clear to me. I really wanted a business where technology was the core. Um, and I think that I, I sort of looked at two different options uh, after after I sold this previous company. I spent some time looking at um, uh, AI and ML, um, mm-hmm. you know, as, as a lot of people have, and then also robotics. And I decided the robotics was the, the one for me um, because it felt more tractable. And um, it also felt like uh, it was maybe a little bit further outside of Google's sweet spot. Um, you know, TBD on what happens with some of the ML companies out there, but I, I wonder if Google will just eventually do all of that. Right. Um, and then within robotics, you know, it was obviously a huge field. I just started learning, uh, you know, so I, I got some books on robotics. Um, I'd studied uh, CS in school and got a master's as well, but I'd never done anything in robotics. Um, and started talking to people. So I probably spent six months just reading about robotics, talking to people, and then sort of, you know, refreshing myself on, oh yeah, that's how an electric motor works. And oh yeah, that, you know, trying to sort of understand the hardware side of things a little right. bit. I mean, now talk to me more about that. Like there's this point at which uh, an entrepreneur says, I'm gonna start a business. Like that's a that's a big mental leap. And you've, you'd already gone through this, but number one, you come back. Like, so you must, the bug, it, you clearly got the bug. But you decided not only to come back, but you came back to do hardware. How when you when you thought about going and hard going and doing hardware, how much in you know trepidation or fear or unknown you know did you sense? Did you talk to other entrepreneurs who were like, "You're hardware, you're crazy," or was it far? You know, how did that how did that sequence go? And how did you think about hardware versus just another company? I mean, especially yeah. given in this case you had MLAI, which would have been, you know, pretty much a straight software play. Right. But you jumped and, and went to hardware. So I was definitely intimidated by hardware mm-hmm. uh, at first. And um, it was through talking to a bunch of people, who, some of whom who had made the transition from being 
on the software side into running a business that also involved hardware, um, that it kind of got comfortable with it. And the thing I realized uh, is that most hardware businesses, the core of what they're doing is actually still software. Um, that's obviously not true yeah. for, for some businesses, you know, like SpaceX, I'm sure they've got plenty of software, but the hardware is probably really damn hard. I mean, really hard. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the uh, for, for a lot of businesses, you know, if you look at like something like Amazon Echo, right? It's actually just software, right? You've got some relatively commodity microphones and, you know, some simple industrial design and engineering there, but it's, and it's all software. Um, and I think that's actually true about a lot of the self-driving car companies too, where right. you're, you're basically understanding sensors, understanding how to integrate sensors. Um, there's some supply chain there, but it's mostly the software. You know, you're using an off-the-shelf vehicle. Yeah, and, and so you talked about that window where you're like reacclimatized to the hardware environment. You're like, oh yeah, I remember this sort of how electric motor work. Does that infer like before when you were younger that you had that streak of, you know, taking apart the toaster and building crazy things? Did, had you been interacting with hardware far, you know, far before this in, on your life's journey or, or is it something you, you came cold into hardware right around then? So my, my dad was a, a contractor when I was growing up, a uh, carpenter and, you know, kind of guy who thought it was a ripoff to take his car to a mechanic. Um, so I kind of was always working on stuff with him. And that was probably, I, I did sort of feel comfortable with working with my hands. Yeah. Um, and that actually influenced the, where I wanted to start my business too. Because I, you know, I grew up uh, in rural Vermont and working for my dad in high school pretty much every summer. Um, did a lot of manual labor, a lot of construction, carpentry, sort of carpenter's assistant kind of work and, um, hated it at the time, but also found myself coming back to it because it's so tangible. And if you do a good job, you're going to build something that's going to last a hundred years. And it's right. really rare for that to be true in, in almost any other, uh, walk of life. Um, so when I was thinking about robotics, I was like, hey, maybe there's a way to bring robotics into construction in, in some way, shape or form. And um, talked to my dad about it. He thought it was a pretty bad idea. Um, <laughs> and then kind of really went through, you know, we, I think we had like a, he picked me up at the airport and my parents are like three and a half hours from the nearest airport. Okay. Um, so he picked me up at the airport and I was like, hey, this is what I want to do. And we spent three and a half hours sort of walking through in nitty gritty all of the types of tasks that go into building a house right um and that really helped me sort of understand these are things that it feels like a robot could do these are things it feels like a robot couldn't do and um yeah that was kind of the, the origin of the story and also i think the origin of how i got comfortable with getting into hardware so jumping from this point you and your dad have had a great conversation best person you know best person to get advice from in the world but you're like all right uh you said your dad had some, you know, some things he pointed out. You had really detailed discussions. How did you go from that point? You've gotten your own internal feeling. Hey, this this intersection, robotics, construction, could be really powerful. How do you go from there? How did you go from there to that point where you're like, this is the product that I want to do? That narrowing process, because as you said, tremendous amount of steps that go into building a, a home or any structure. How did you think about that problem? How did you narrow it down to to what became your company? So, um, once I had some intuitions on the types of tasks that robots could do, then I started looking at the data to validate the market opportunity. So I just, you know, found some market research reports to try to understand what is construction? What is earth moving? So, you know, our, our vision for the company is we automate heavy equipment to make construction safer, faster, and more affordable. Mm -hmm. Um, so I started to learn about heavy, heavy equipment, heavy construction in particular. Um, and turns out it's a big market. It's about $130 billion worth of earth that's moved every year in just the United States. Um, so that kind of, and I, I need to learn what that really meant and sort of, uh, you know, understand. Because you, you see big market numbers uh, often, um, but I needed to really like validate, hey, this is stuff that a, I could imagine an autonomous piece of equipment doing at some point. Um, and sort of once I had checked that box, then I really needed to, again, roll up my sleeves. And what I did is I actually rented an excavator. Um, so my parents, you know, they live in rural Vermont. I uh, rented a 15 ton John Deere excavator. And I said, hey, mom, you've, you've always said you wanted to have a pond. I'm gonna dig you a pond. Um, so I spent a week on this machine, uh, put 77 hours on it. Wow. And uh, dug her a nice pond. Um, and that kind of helped me 
just get the basics of how you operate this equipment and develop right. some intuition and sort of understand, you know, I, whenever I was working with it, I was thinking to myself, oh, I could imagine writing an algorithm to this or, oh, no, this is not. This is something that human judgment is really required for. Right. And I kind of started to understand what are the areas where, um, where a robot could be helpful. And then once I'd done that, I, I sort of traveled around the country talking to every excavation contractor that I even tangentially knew who would be mm -hmm. willing to talk to me. So, you know, a lot of like uncles and fathers-in-law, friends of mine, and, um, and got a lot of really good feedback. Um, and then once I had sort of understood the nitty gritty, uh, and I, I, I still have a lot to learn here. I mean, you know, you can, you can spend your whole career being an excavation contractor and, and there's a lot of art to it. Um, but once I sort of developed some, uh, facility with, with the, the trade, then, uh, I started talking to investors um, and that was sort of the next step is, hey, is this even a fundable idea? One thing I'd love to check with you, since you had already done a company before and, and gone through sort of not cradle to grave, but cradle to strong company and a, and a sale, what did you, do you feel like there were things you learned the first time that influenced, you were talking about as an example, I could, you know, you were talking about uh, total market size, TAM, right? Yeah. And you were talking about going out and doing customer discovery. These are things that, you know, you read about it in a book, but you just did them. Now, had you done that with your first company, or is this something you're you're you did you did you bring a lot of knowledge in from the first company that helped you go through that early phase? Do you feel like, uh, yeah, that you had extra knowledge, sort of an inside edge on that that maybe others didn't have because you you yeah. guys had started a company? I think so. I mean, I'd done a little bit of customer development in my previous company too. But I don't think I fully understood the power of the, the market size. You know, Mark Andreessen has this quote, uh, great team meets mediocre market, market wins. Yes. Mediocre team meets great market, market wins. Um, and you want that tailwind. You, know, you want to have pull from the market. Um, and, and so far, it feels like we're seeing that. Gotcha. What kind of engagements did you have as you're going through this process with mentors and colleagues and you know, anybody who has knowledge on this, you talked about sort of preparing to get to the VCs. Had you already sort of assembled your advisors and things around? And how did you approach that? Like, how do you get smart um, as a CEO and as a founder? What did you surround yourself with? And what would you recommend others as they're thinking about starting a company? What do you put around you? And how much do you put around you to be as successful as you can be? I think there's kind of two dimensions to it. One is the industry expertise. So that's for us, that's hardware, robotics, perception, software, construction, excavation, all that stuff. And then there's sort of the general company building stuff, which is, uh, you know, how do you run a fundraising process? Um, you know, what are sort of the legal ins and outs here? Um, you know, all, all, all that kind of side of things. And uh, they're both really important. Um, I think that since I had done another company before, I felt a little bit more comfortable in sort of the general company building stuff, mm -hmm. or at least, you know, just getting your seed round done. Um, but uh, I had a lot to learn on the robotic side of things. So that's actually one of the big reasons I wanted to work with you guys at Lemnos is mm -hmm. you've, you've got a reputation as being the hardware uh, seed stage fund in, in Silicon Valley. And I was like, well, you know, there's probably a lot of stuff I don't know. There's some unknown unknowns out there for me. Um, and I wanted to work with you guys so that I could kind of see around corners um, based on the pattern recognition that you guys have. Um, so that was that was how I thought about it. Right. In terms of your colleagues, when you when you uh, how many uh, people did you share this idea with, and how many of them were uh, uh, at, from the gamut of you are absolutely crazy to oh my gosh I should have thought of this idea or how do I join your team? How did people react as you gave them the early you know the early scope of this thing? So before I had anything, it was 95% you're crazy. Right. Um, this is just too hard of a technology problem. Um, you've never done robotics before. Um, my co-founder of my previous company, I probably spent two or three months trying to convince him to work with me on this. And he wound up investing, but he just didn't feel like uh, the, the technology was going to be achievable. And then 18 months later, once we'd kind of gotten our first prototype up and running, then it flipped. And everybody was like, oh, wow, this is great. How come nobody else is doing this? How did you think of this idea? Um, and uh, I think that that's cool, too, because I, it's a business where the technology really is core. Um, you know, there's a lot of businesses out there that are really more about business model and marketing and sales. But this one, it feels like if we can continue to push forward and hit our roadmap from a technology standpoint, 
then there's going to be a lot of demand out there. Talk to me really quickly. Uh, I'll relay the story. I mean, I remember the first time we came over to, once you had your own facility, first you were here and, and we got to see the machine in action and it was, you know, still really early, but the, just the, there's a raw power associated with a Bobcat in that. So the emotional hook for you guys, I mean, I, I don't know, it activates some instinct that I think every kid has of, you know, you know, the, the, the Tonka toy, this is the reality of it. So the, I, I would, I would assert that, you know, in my own experience, I bet you maybe in others, when they see it in action, there's this visceral emotional thing. But how do you drive and, and, and mate that to the, again, this idea that there's a great business inside of that? How do you, how do you uniquely bring those together when you, you know, explain to the company to folks? Um, well, I think that a lot of people, it's, it's actually funny. Construction is the second largest sector globally after agriculture. Mm -hmm. It's enormous. It's about $10 trillion a year globally. Um, but a lot of people don't really have any familiarity with how it actually happens. And I've, I've sort of knew that, but now that I've started a business in the construction world, now I've really come to understand that, you know, mm -hmm. whenever I talk to people, it's sort of like starting from, from a standstill to explain to them how the, the sector works and what the value chain looks like and who are the key stakeholders. And, um, and I think that just having some sort of exposure to that, working with my dad and, you know, just hearing, you know, around the kitchen table when I was growing up, that helped me get some insight on how we could slot in. Um, and uh, that has so far largely been proven out. You know, we've gotten some real interest from some very large construction firms. Um, we've done a couple small pilot projects. Um, it, you know, it feels, obviously we're still very early. We're companies only been around for less than two years now. Yeah. Um, but, uh, it, it feels like, uh, we're on track. Gotcha. And as you're going through this process, and I'm sure this answer changes and will continue to change, but today or in this frame of where you are with your company, what are the most important tools that you've used to, to build out the product? And this could, this, this answer can be process. It could be a, a key process, a anything what is it what mm. sort of the things that you uniquely use that are they're giving you a little bit of an edge and giving your team an edge yeah well maybe i shouldn't share that well <laughs> come on everyone needs a little something but uh no so i actually think that the way that engineering interviews are typically done in silicon valley is silly you know the the brain teasers yeah i'm just you know I'm tell six, me seven things you can do with a single brick all the um, yeah the yeah all right I'm Squares sick of the brain teasers. Sort of, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And um, I guess, yes, if you went through the Google interview <laughs> process, you had a few of those delivered to you. Yeah. Um, and I think that actually a much more sane and ultimately predictive interviewing method is to do two things. Um, first, pair programming. Mm -hmm. So you just spend a day or two and maybe it's, you know, maybe you do one day on the week and one weekend day or, you know, however you make it work, um, pair programming. Mm -hmm. And you just actually pick some kind of feature or bug or whatever off of your Trello board or whatever you use. And, uh, and then you work on it with, with the candidate. And I find that tremendously um, informative. As opposed to the straight programming test where you're judging it on the backside or sending them to the whiteboard. You're like, yep. literally, we're going to solve this problem together. Yep. And, and it, it can work. Like, I think that a, a, t a sort of a toy project can work too. Mm -hmm. Um it's even more fun though if you can, and it, it doesn't always work. Sometimes there's not something you can carve off easily from your backlog, but um, but just actually writing some code and without the sort of artificial time pressure and the like. No, you can't Google that. You know, it's you know anytime anybody's like implement quick sort. It's like why would you do that? You know. <laughs> um, so so I try to do that, and the second thing, and this this is, can be harder to swing, is actually do a consulting project. So we do a pair programming project that goes well. Then we do a one to three week consulting projects where the candidate works on it at home. Um, and, and it's paid, you know, so if, if they're hired, then on site or off site, off site often, okay. I mean, it's on site as much as possible, but right. it's, it's hard just if, you know, if other people have other commitments. Right. Um, so typically it's like, Hey, take this home and then, you know, maybe the following week come in for an afternoon we can go over it or whatever. Um, and that's great because it basically lets you work together before you work together. Mm -hmm. um, you still don't know for sure, um, but just getting some more time and some actual um, uh, sort of time in the saddle together, I think makes a huge difference. Yeah. What was the most, to date, two years in, what's been the most surprising thing that, that about the process of building your company or, or discovery in the market that, uh, 
that you didn't expect that that you've run into mm, that's a good one there's a lot to learn in construction and i've been <laughs> i've been making all the dumb mistakes and and uh and learning a lot i would say even though i saw the the sort of high level market numbers um going on to some of these bigger construction sites it's just it's the scale is really emotionally impressive right you know so i was a few weeks ago i was on a a, a high-rise foundation um, on the peninsula in, in uh, sunnyvale i think and um just this giant pit in the ground you know 50 foot deep pit you know 300 feet long 100 feet wide something you know just this huge pit in the ground right and uh just the the fact that we as a as a civilization can build these things is pretty inspiring, actually. Um, and I think it's really exciting to think about how eventually Bill can can be involved in that kind of a project. When when you started your company, how much or did you allocate time for the unknown? You've been through a company already. You're coming into a second one. You're building your schedules. Did that change how you plan for the unknown or plan for that unexpected? Did it leave you more cautious from a schedule perspective, or or did it really you you learned a lot, but you're like, look, I'm you know I'm gonna I'm gonna do it the way I did before. Or did that did, did I don't know. It's it's so hard to predict engineering schedules. I've yeah. just when you're prototyping and really doing research and development. Yeah. I've just sort of become zen and said, you know, I don't know how long it's gonna take. Somewhere between. I think you can kind of be like, this is, you know, like a five minute thing. Right. This is like an hour or two thing. This is a day or two thing. This is a week or two thing. And this is like a month to six thing. Like that's kind of, you know, are, are you guys, hard are you guys in, in particular, are you guys using agile and are you going through sprints and are you, are you bidding out or how do you No, No, yeah, yeah. we, I mean, we do some of agile ish things, but we don't have a lot of, um, we're certainly not actually an agile shop by any means at all. Right. And I'm not looking for the, uh, there's a religion associated right. with Agile or whatever. I, where I was going with it a little bit is, you know, there's this common statement that hardware is waterfall and software is Agile. And you were saying, well, you know, a lot of what we're doing is software. How do you guys think about, you know, and, and again, in the phase that you're in, of bringing these worlds together in, in terms of even limited estimation? I mean, at some level, somebody's out there, maybe it's your investors going, hey, when are you going to be here? When are you going to be right. there? And, and internally, you're trying to keep schedules. But these two worlds coming together, how did you, um, coming from your first company being software, coming into combination of hardware and software, how did you think about those worlds interacting from scheduling? I think you're a lot smarter about this than I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think you're right that hardware does naturally lend itself to being more of a waterfall development style. We've just kind of tried to get that stuff out of the way. You know, we spent just the first probably three or four months not even writing a line of code really just you know figuring out all the hardware side of things um, and we've had to and we didn't figure it out 100 percent, and we've had to go back and, and you know sort of redo a few things but now that we've sort of but i think it was sort of like a it, it is fairly discreet for us yeah. because we're not doing a lot of custom hardware uh, design and manufacturing fabrication um so we kind of you know, we can sort of flip into hardware mode a little bit, but we're, we're primarily just on the software side. Yeah, I mean, I, f I, f I found it interesting, you know, obviously engaging with you guys. I think you've done a really good job of giving us sort of rough time blocks, but it's, I think you've also were really clear with us that you're in this, for lack of a better term, really prototyping phase. Right. And you kept our expectations in check around what that was, is that they were looser time blocks. Yep. And I'm sure there will come a time where you had more yeah. to, okay, we need to build a bunch of these. Yeah. Rigidity will come into the system. But no, that was something that every team that works with us is unique. But you guys were really good about saying, this is a general block. Here's what we're doing inside of it. We knew what was in the time block yeah. and the rough dimension of the time block. But actual exit point and stuff like that, you were like, look, yeah. we got to go through this. And this is what we're, we're just going to go off and do. And you can come in anytime and see where we are. But this right. is the rough block that we're in. I think that's right. And I, I think that is inherent when you're doing something that nobody's done before. Um, there's really not a template that you can that you can fit into that well. Right. So what's the, oh, this question, it's just like, yeah, there's no great answer and there's probably a million answers, but what's been the hardest part for you about being a hardware startup founder? What's the thing so far on your voyage that's been like, ah, oh, this is tough? You know, honestly, it's it's, Maybe just like the logistics of finding office space. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you have a unique situation around yeah. that a little bit, right? Yeah, no, we, we absolutely do. And we've got a, a five ton machine that's driving around autonomously. But uh, it's just... And a, by the way, folks, 
literally five times. Right. Yeah. Um, and the the forge that you guys have at Lemnos, it's a little thing in some ways, but it's actually a, really a huge deal for us because you know, we were able to get in, spend a couple months here, um, and and then go and find a larger testing facility. And that flexibility, and just in, in terms of being a hardware startup where you've got actual stuff that you need yeah. to, you know, sort of carry around with you and set up, makes a big difference. No, it's been amazing how many I've, I've how many other founders I've sent to you because it, that challenge that you faced, uh, you know, we could talk about like Dave Merrill and some of the things that that he's doing, right? Where he has unique space challenges as well. Firing anything into the air, right? You're on the ground, but with a with a with a vehicle with just you know a tremendous amount of potential power in it. Um, hardware folks have to really you know they have to step outside the bounds of calling a commercial broker and right. saying I just need three thousand square feet of you know class A you know right. workspace available. Right. So it, it's definitely one that you you know you don't uh, uh, more and more founders as hardware becomes you know more like what you're doing and and you know in addition to consumer electronics and other things. Yeah, that's definitely a, a unique challenge. Did you? Uh, I mean, I know a lot about that space that you're in, um, but uh, how do you? I mean, how do you think about that going forward? That need for that? Do you guys imagine someday like you have like more like an office, and then you have your like your proving grounds in essence, right. or is really for you? Are you know a lot of the proving ground going to be you know on the customer sites and things like that? Um, I think longer term that will be the answer, mm-hmm. but we always need to be testing hardware. Yeah, and. Uh, being able to be close to your hardware just it just reduces your cycle time for for iterating, and I think that's actually tremendously important, and it's one of the reasons we've been able to move pretty fast. Yeah, and we run the Bobcat, and it's literally twenty feet from our computers, um, and it makes it makes so you can test stuff much more quickly. Right. Um, what advice would you offer to other founders? There, the this the audience around this. A lot of folks are at, they're at the precip of saying I, I want to become an entrepreneur. They're exploring it. They're trying to say. Is this for me? Um, you've done it more than once now. If you could pass a couple of pearls of wisdom on to, to the folks behind you who are getting ready to, to, to start a company as well, what would you tell them? It's not that risky. A lot of people talk about the financial risk involved in starting a company. But for most people in Silicon Valley with a technical background, they're actually very fortunate in that it's not financially risky. You can always stop working on your startup and go get a job as an engineer, a product manager, a marketer, whatever you do um, at some other company. And I think what happens is people, they, they act like it, they talk about it like it's financial risk, but really what it is is social risk. And what's more scary to them is doing something different from their friends or doing something that's a little off the beaten path or, you know, they worry about, you know, what am I going to tell my friends if I, if my startup fails, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and I think most people understand that that's, you know, you got you to gotta take risks in life if you want to do something exciting. Um, but I think people kind of get hung up and they focus on the financial risk and they don't, they don't sort of isolate out the social risk because the financial risk, I think, is, is actually relatively minimal for, for most folks who are fortunate enough to be in the Bay Area. Right. So we talked about that. And part of it is the Bay Area is even more, you know, there are a couple of areas in the world. I always say if you go to Israel, you go to Shenzhen, you come to the Silicon Valley, a couple other areas in the world. The, the intersection of the culture, the companies, everything is much more accepting of that risk. Um, but if we were to step out of the valley, right, it's a little bit different environment. You're sure. saying, hey, if you're in the valley, it's not that much different. Do you, did your, do you think your background led you to be more risk accepting or was that a, did you face maybe with your first company that, that jump where you, you, know, you really had to stare at that risk? Or had you really, you know, over your life felt like maybe you were prepared and more more risk taking throughout your life, or was this a a big pivot that you went through, you know, with with uh, with your first company, or and and to a lesser extent this company? No, I, I think for me it was something I knew I wanted to do for a long time. Okay. I mean, even in high school, I remember thinking startups that looks like fun. And I think in my, you know, my dad was an entrepreneur; he uh, had his own contracting business for a long time. So I think that that probably helped me get a little bit more comfortable with it too. But uh, I I think that the, and and also I I went to school where um, there's a lot of sort of pull into the finance and consulting world. Mm -hmm. Um, But I knew that was so not for me that in some ways it almost made it easier to be like, okay, well, I'm going to strike out into a startup. Um, Whereas maybe if I had been in a school where there's a lot of people going to be like PMs at Facebook or something, um, then it might have been a little bit more challenging. But uh, no, for me, it, was, it wasn't a big pivot. Right. 
So I, I, I'm excited to ask you about this because you, again, you have this opportunity as the as a repeat entrepreneur. Um, how did you choose and and think about the venture process? You talked a little bit about Lemnos and. Lemnos was both about uh, working, you know, on the hardware, on the business, but also, you know, capital. Having gone through the process of growing a company and selling it, when you returned and said, you know, this is the relationship I want with venture, how did you approach that with the knowledge from, from your first company? Did it change your perspective on who or how you wanted to work with folks? And uh, yeah, what can you share about that? So I think the hardware piece was definitely top of mind for me. So, so Founders Fund was the other um, larger investor in our in our seed, um, Jeff Lewis there, and he's actually uh, left to start his own fund uh, recently. Um, but and, and I think both Lemnos, uh, you guys, and Jeff um, were very decisive. You know, there's there's sort of reputation for investors in Silicon Valley of kind of stringing entrepreneurs along where they don't really give you a no and they don't really give you a yes and they sort of are flaky about responding to emails and. That was 100% not the case for either of you guys. And, and I just appreciate that because I think that one thing I learned is that you know, capital is capital. Um, that's honestly like the biggest thing you're going to get from an investor. And then as an entrepreneur, it's up to you to turn that capital into something interesting. But at the same time, and I say that because, you know, I think maybe like the, the brand or whatever, like, you know, um, I, I think the more important thing is do you actually like working with the people on a day to day basis. And that sort of being upfront, being decisive, um, being a straight shooter, that matters a ton to me. Um, and uh, NEA um, led our, our Series A, um, Forrest Basket and Aaron Jacobson there, and I feel exactly the same way about them. So I've been very fortunate, I think, to, to get involved with investors that are very upfront or very clear. Um, there's not a lot of games, and, uh, and I think that I'd recommend any, any entrepreneur who's looking for funding to, to keep that in mind. Yeah, and I would share from the other side of that story again, and I, I talked about it earlier, the emotional side of what you were doing was just, I mean, there was just something visceral about that. But for us, you know, no matter what as an investor, it can be the most emotional, emotionally activating pitch. But it was really the business and that opportunity. And it was, you know, the, the way you presented it to us. And again, this intersection, what is going to happen? Robotics and, and construction meet the you know, second, you know, second largest business on the planet. How does that get impacted by what is going to be, you know, one of the largest shifts in productivity ever? Right. How do those come together? Um, it's a, it, you can immediately say the TAM on that or the opportunity is going to be huge, but you're able to zero in and say, all right, let's, let's take a look at this one part of the business right. and what we can do. And that, that's really important on the other side. And it helps, yeah. you know, I think, a, a, Figure a firm, out your niche. Yeah. A firm to, to, to be able to jump off that cliff very quickly. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's the, the intersection of those two things that makes for a, for a good relationship. So the last thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over with you is, uh, and I, I've asked this to entrepreneurs in the past, and they're like, what? I don't have time to do this. But uh, mm -hmm. it's the uh, classic, what book are you reading or, uh, or you know, gadget that you're carrying? Something that either inspires you or, or, is, or gives you a, a little bit of respite, a little bit of peace oh, yeah. in, in, in what is a, you know, a crazy life of the, of the startup CEO. What is it that, that uh, sort of inspires your passion? Something you've seen or something you've read that you're just like, Wow, it, this is as amazing as what I'm doing, but in a completely different vein. Actually, I love to read. Um, I try to read every night. It just kind of you know, 20 minutes lets me sort of reset and fall asleep because otherwise I'm up thinking about work for hours. But uh, so the kinds of books. Well, right now I'm reading um, Life on the Mississippi by Mark Twain. Ah. Um, and it's sort of a memoir or autobiography. Yes. And... Um, one of the things I think is really interesting about it is the level of detail that he goes into about the craft of being a steamboat pilot, which is what he did on the Mississippi before he became a writer. And um, in a way, it actually kind of reminds me about learning about the construction industry, you know, because these steamboats were the, the pinnacle of technology in, yeah. the, in this time period, right? And he really tells you about, you know, how the boilers worked and, and how the, the paddles worked and how you, know, you know, how you avoid the sandbar and how you can see where the sandbar is. And um, I think it's interesting. Just anytime you talk to somebody who's passionate about what they do and excited to share that with you, even if it's 150 years later, yeah. um, uh, I think that's, that's actually pretty inspiring and pretty interesting to me. As a, as a book lover, um, do you find, what's your ratio of fiction to nonfiction? And I'll ask a follow-on on that. Start there. Mm -hmm. About half and half. Okay. Do you find, 
do you find that like reading nonfiction and probably drawn to things related to your business or businesses, economics, all these things, uh, you said you read 20 minutes before you go to bed, stressful, non-stressful, does it, does it energize you? Can you get to sleep after going through that or, or is, you know? So there's another book I read recently, which is a fiction book, um, Lonesome Dove. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it sounds like it's like a romance novel or something, no. but no, yeah. It, uh, it's a cowboy novel, won the Pulitzer in the 1970, mid, mid seventies. And then they made an HBO movie about it and stuff. And, uh, starts a little slow, but oh my God, is it, it picks up. And that was a book where I meant to read it for 20 minutes. And then three hours <laughs> later, it's 2 AM. I'm like, oh my God, I, I got to get to work in the morning. So that happens sometimes too. Yeah. I find some folks, uh, they, they concentrate their nonfiction <laughs> reading at other points in time because it's so tied to their work that it almost brings them back in. Right. And fiction is the, is the getaway. It's the, it's the gateway yeah. to somewhere else at the end of a day. So yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you for your time. And uh, we'll put all the links in in terms of how to reach out to you if entrepreneurs want to ask you any questions. And uh, congratulations on all the success. And uh, uh, we encourage all the readers to jump up on your site and uh, learn more about uh, Build. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate right. it. Have a good one. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Into the Forge. If you have questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me via the email address podcast at lemnos.vc, L-E-M-N-O-S dot V-C. Next week, we are excited to interview the founders of Field Vision, who are bringing professional video analytics to club sports teams. My son plays traveling hockey, so you can guess why I'm excited about this startup. And for older episodes, please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or listen to episodes on the lemnos.vc website. Have a great day.